Hi, this is Kendrick with worldmedicalschool.org. We're going to talk about mastoiditis. This is a lot more uh, less common than I thought it was. It's uh, about 1 in 25,000 per year uh, incidence rate. So it's, uh, it's not showing up uh, quite as much as it used to just since the advent of treating our uh, acute otitis medias with antibiotics. And that's essentially what the... What all mastoiditis comes from is a complication of acute otitis media. And we'll talk about in a second the anatomy here, where the, uh, how the middle ear uh, is connected to the mastoid area. But the causative agents are usually uh, some of the same ones that cause acute otitis media, but also um, pseudomonas, which you don't see as much in acute otitis media, and uh, staph aureus, uh, strep pyogenes are also there. So, um, and then we have some of these um, anaerobes that show up too, and some gram negatives, but those are a lot less common. So here we are in the middle ear looking out at the tympanic membrane. So we're looking laterally here, and you can see right up above the tympanic membrane you have this epitympanic recess and this is an area that's mostly walled off by bony structure but it has some soft tissue as well that um, that connects it to the middle ear cavity and it can be uh, used to uh, equalize pressure and uh, uh, be a general buffer for the middle ear cavity but it also has an extension into the mastoid antrum and the mastoid antrum is uh, adjacent to all these mastoid air cells and these mastoid air cells are said to serve the purpose of uh, pro providing protection for trauma or uh, or absorbing uh, sound um, and I'm not sure exactly how that all works but but you have these little sacs they're walled off by thin uh, septae of bone and acute otitis media can move up into this epitympanic recess, up into the mastoid antrum, and then it can move down into these uh, mastoid air cells. And as you can see, it kind of has to break through some barriers along the way. So this purulent material is causing some destruction of tissue in order to get down into this area. And you can also imagine that uh, once you've uh, had an erosion of this this area, you're a little bit more likely to get it again. Here's just a picture of the mastoid air cells. That's another view in here. So in an acute presentation, usually these kids will have posterior post auricular pain. So just pain behind their ear, some some redness, some tenderness back there, and some of them will also have an outward displacement of the pinna, so the ears kind of stick out, and in most cases, you, you'll have a preceding history of acute otitis media, but in some cases they won't remember or, or didn't notice because it was a fairly uh, asymptomatic infection. But the consensus is that basically all of these do come from acute otitis media. There's also some nonspecific changes like fever, headache, rhinorrhea. Hearing loss can be in the acute setting as well as the chronic setting. Acute more because there's... Uh, there's an obstruction there with, with purulent material or chronic because there's been some scarring of the area. And the subacute process is when uh, you have a slower, uh, slower spreading infection that may not cause these acute symptoms and so we don't pick them up as soon. And those are the ones that are more likely to cause neurological complications and uh, bezold abscess. We'll talk about the rest of the complications here. So if you picture uh, this infection as just being able to spread in any direction, which it can, and then you picture the structures that are around the mastoid area. So if you, if you have invasion medially, of course medial to the mastoid, process, you have uh, your epidural space, um, your dura, you have uh, the temporal lobe, and also the cerebellum can be affected. 
And uh, if you go straight down from the mastoid, then you have the connection of uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which can actually detach in some cases of spread. Um, you can ha cause damage to the labyrinth. Um, you can cause damage to your uh, hearing organs. So anything in this area obviously can be uh, damaged or destroyed by invade, invading infection. This bezold abscess is more of a uh, superficial abscess that can actually be seen um, and, uh, and can be drained from, from the outside as well. Uh, Great Inigo syndrome, I'm not sure if that's how you say it, is just the uh, complex of otorrhea, retroorbital pain, and sixth nerve deficit, which all can be caused by uh, mastoiditis spread. And then in the more serious cases where you get intracranial problems, then you get epidural abscesses, which can have a mass effect causing seizures, uh, as well as temporal lobe abscess, venous sinus thrombosis, uh, and all the complications that can come with that, and then a meningitis is also a possibility as well. So when you suspect mastoiditis, you get a CT. Um, they can do those with without contrast, but if you are suspecting some kind of a spread, then uh, you can do it with contrast. It will help help to uh, see where, where the spread might be going. So this will also help us to decide if this is acute mastoiditis acute mastoiditis with periostitis or coalescent mastoiditis. So the with periostitis just means that you have pus in the mastoid cavities, whereas coalescent mastoiditis means that those bony septae that we were looking at before have been destroyed, and so you kind of get just one big pool of pus uh, in the mastoid area. So if, uh, if you do have uh, periostitis and and actually, in either case, you can do meringotomy for culture, and uh, that will help us to know what antibiotics to use. So if you don't know what antibiotics, um, if we haven't uh, obtained a specimen that will help us to know what the bacteria is sensitive to, uh, then we use basically as broad a spectrum as we can get. So uh, ceftazidine or cefepine. Um, or piptazo. So any, these are all things that cover Pseudomonas, because remember Pseudomonas was on our list of causative agents. And then add vancomycin uh, for uh, methicillin resistant staph. And uh, you also have mastoidectomy, which um, you may need to do in order to drain the purulent fu fluid. And uh, that was will be determined by uh, the severity, whether or not you need to do the mastoidectomy. So in our differential diagnosis, of course, this could be like a lymphadenopathy. So if you see uh, acute otitis media with uh, bulging back there, you know, the bulging could be poster posterior auricular lymphadenopathy. Um, so look for some of these other signs. Um, also, periauricular cellulitis can, can cause some swelling and redness, but it'll look a little bit more superficial. Perichondritis of the auricle, it's just the inflammation of the of the cartilage of the auricle. Mumps, um, except that, that swelling is going to be more in front of the ear than behind it. And then mastoid tumor uh, can also have a similar look, but will probably less, be less painful, less symptomatic. So thanks to Gray's Anatomy for giving us our pictures today. And uh, please do us the favor of taking a second to write one practice question for those uh, that will be watching the video after you and post it in the comments. That, will, they will, that way they'll have a way to test themselves and what they learned. And uh, other comments are always appreciated. Please uh, share the link. Or if you want to be involved more, go to worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer. Thanks.